morning, everybody. Good morning. It is good to see you here this morning. We uh, don't have any snow to contend with. I must offer apologies for, I know, uh, a couple folks got here and uh, last Sunday, and the place was frozen over and empty, and we, we tried to call it as soon as we felt that we needed to, and it was one of those Sundays, you know, what do you do? Do you try? Do you not try? So, bless your heart, if you showed up last week and, and nobody was here, please accept my apologies. We tried to get word around as quickly and as efficiently as we could, but even in this day of modern technology, it doesn't always work out the way we like. So, thank you for your understanding. Uh, I do also want to remind you that after the morning worship service this morning, we do have opportunity for you to interact with any of the leadership team members or myself. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, concerning the direction the church is going and the direction the Church of the Brethren denomination is going. Uh, we want to make a wise decision, and in order to be able to do that, we want you to be as fully informed as possible. So this is uh, today, and then even next Sunday after the morning worship service, uh, you'll have opportunity to talk with any of us uh, on the leadership team, and we will do our best to answer your questions. So, that brings us to 2 Peter chapter 2. Open your Bibles, please. 2 Peter chapter 2. We're actually going to uh, start in verse 10 and uh, pick up a little bit of things that I did not cover two weeks ago. Three weeks ago, thinking about the snow week now, three weeks ago we talked about the existence of false teachers. Uh, there in the first part of chapter 2 in 2 Peter. We talked about their existence and that it was a long time problem that Moses even had to deal with it. Uh, way back at the beginning, the founding of the, the nation of Israel, there have always been that threat of false teachers coming in among God's people and creating confusion, leading people astray, causing all kinds of dissension and problems within the community. Two weeks ago, we looked at God's ability to bring both judgment and deliverance. God is not unable and certainly not uninterested in making a distinction between those false teachers and his own children. He's perfectly capable of doing that. He is perfectly capable of dealing with false teachers. We saw that uh, in a variety of uh, examples that we looked at two weeks ago, as well as the ones listed here in 2 Peter. This morning we want to take a little closer look at the character of these false teachers, and also some of the characteristics and the tactics that they use to disseminate their false teaching. So we're going to pick it up in chapter 2 of 2 Peter verse 10. Peter's describing them, he says, especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They walk according to the flesh in the lusts of uncleanness. You know, it's amazing as, as you have a chance to look at it and think about it and, and see some of these false teachers and look at the course of their lives, false teaching and sexual immorality go hand in hand. They really do. What a tragedy that there have been so many people who have stood up in, in places of respect and authority as ministers of the gospel, and their teaching has turned away from the truth, and so has their lifestyle. And many, not all, but many have ended up in gross immorality, bringing shame upon the name of Christ. False teaching and sexual immorality truly go hand in hand in so many cases. But not only that, it says that they are presumptuous. They're, 
The message of these false teachers is an arrogant message. It's an arrogant message. They, they not only put themselves on a different moral plane, but they despise authority. That is, all authority except their own. They set themselves up as the authority, and they decry anybody else or any other group or any other teaching. They're the ones exclusively that have the Word of God. So they said. They're arrogant in their presentation. They're presumptuous. The word presumptuous there is an interesting word. In verse 10 it says, it means to go beyond what is right and proper. To go beyond the limits of propriety, good sense, and thought. They, they, they just, what they do makes no sense. It goes way beyond the boundaries of just common, ordinary decency. And yet, they're presumptuous, they're arrogant in this, and they press their own direction, their own teaching, their own way, regardless of any of the, the pushback that they might get from others, from other particularly knowledgeable uh, Christian pastors, teachers, authorities. They just go their own way. It says that they are self-willed. Well, we're not surprised at that, are we? I mean, if they're going to be preaching this kind of an arrogant message, they have to have a little self-will. They see themselves as the, the great trumpeters of truth and they're not going to listen to anybody else. And they're going to do their own thing and run over whomever it is that gets in their way, no matter what. It says that they speak evil of dignitaries. That's an interesting word. It's actually the word glories. And the various translators try to, to help us understand that. Here, New King James has dignitaries. Others talk about angelic beings and so forth. And, and I don't think that any of them are incorrect. I think they're, they're trying to convey the fact that these false teachers speak against anything or anyone who seeks to bring glory to God. They're, they're, they're contrary to that whole idea of giving glory to the one to whom glory is due. They're not interested in God. They're interested in themselves. Now it's interesting how, how it says this. Um, verse 11. Whereas angels, and, and many translations think of the word uh, glories or dignitaries in the sense of addressing angelic beings because that's the very next thing that's, that's there. It says, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them, that's the false teachers, before the Lord. That's kind of amazing. It reminded me of what Jude wrote in his letter in verse 9. It's only a one chapter letter, so we, we just have verses there. Jude was referring to the contest between Michael the archangel and Satan over the body of Moses. You remember in Exodus chapter 34, we have recorded for us there the death of Moses. He went up to Mount Nebo. God graciously gave Moses the opportunity to look across and to see the promised land, to view its beauty and, and to see what God was going to give to this group of people that Moses had led out now for 40 years in the wilderness. And then God himself put Moses to death there on Mount Nebo. Well, what are you going to do with the body? Apparently, Michael showed up, the righteous archangel of Israel, to, uh, to bury the body. I, I think it was extremely wise that God did things the way he did because what would we do, what would people do <clears throat> if the body of Moses was available? Well, they build a shrine and a tabernacle and a 
monument and they worship it and they, you know, they turn it into something special. God says, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to even give people the opportunity. Michael was apparently charged with the responsibility of burying the body. And guess who else showed up? Who absolutely hated Moses and who no doubt wanted to do something to desecrate the body of God's servant. And Jude tells us that not even Michael, the archangel, the greatest, most powerful, most wise, holy angel, did not bring an accusation against Satan. He didn't, you know, he didn't throw down and say, let's go. He said, the Lord rebuke you. Let the I am, let the eternal God of the heavens rebuke you, Satan. These false teachers are willing to say things, to teach about things that they have no concept of. They are willing to make accusations, they are willing to put forward doctrines that are completely wrong, and the angels, who are greater in power and might, don't even bring an accusation but rather they let God intervene and deal with them. And of course, two weeks ago when we were here, we saw that God can deal with the ungodly, can't He? He's able to handle it. He handled it in Noah's day. The whole world by that time, with the exception of Noah and his family, were oh, their thoughts and intents of the heart, Genesis 6 says, were only evil continually. It was a wicked bunch. But God was able to deal with them, wasn't he? Yeah. They had bought all kinds of lies, all kinds of false teaching. They had all turned their backs on God. And God was able to deal with them. Same thing happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God got Noah out. God got Lot out. God knows how to deal with false teachers he knows how to deal with false religion and the rebellion of man, and he knows how to save, to deliver those who are trusting in him. I'm surprised I didn't get an amen on that, because that's good news for us, beloved. We are living in a world that's not in tune with God, aren't we? We're living in a world that's filled with corruption and hate and violence, and to speak the word of God is almost considered a blasphemy by those who don't believe in God because we're the ones that are standing up for truth. We're the ones that stand up for morality. We're the ones that make a statement about what is right and what is wrong, and the world does not want to hear that. And so the world hates the message, and the world hates the messengers, and the world hates God. And isn't it nice to know, isn't it a comfort to your soul to realize that God is fully aware of what's going on in this world and He is making a distinction between those who are His and those who aren't. And He's going to be able to save those who are His and at the same time condemn those who are not. See, that gives us something to get up for in the morning. That means that our lives are not meaningless. They're not purposeless. That means that the things that happen in this world, whether they're pleasant or unpleasant, are not outside of the will of God, not outside the knowledge of God, not outside the, the plan of God. God is working according to His purposes and He is going to use even evil men to accomplish His ultimate goal. It's kind of like when God brought the Babylonians against the Israelites, against this, the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom. Created a real crisis for Habakkuk. Habakkuk says, God, how, how can you use people that are more wicked than us to bring judgment? And God says, Habakkuk, I'm doing something. Now, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me, but believe me, I'm doing something. That's Roger's paraphrase. You can read it in Habakkuk chapter 1. And that's exactly what God did. 
The Babylonian army came, Nebuchadnezzar and his hordes came, and they did as wicked people what the wicked people wanted to do. They captured, they killed, they destroyed, they did all the things that wicked people wanted to do. But God was guiding even that in his sovereignty so that they accomplished the purpose of God to bring correction on God's people, to bring deliverance to God's people, Daniel and others that were carried into Babylon, that God taught them some lessons. They came out of that 70-year captivity and back over into the promised land, and idolatry was not a problem after that. God can use even the wrath of man to accomplish his purpose. So we should take heart when we see the things that are going on today. Don't be afraid, beloved. God is at work behind the scenes. And God is going to set the record straight. And I think that's why here the angels don't have to feel like they, you know, they're going to jump in and do something. Let God work the thing out. God's got this under control. And so they can calmly go about the work that God has given them to do knowing that God is in control. But these false teachers, they speak an arrogant, arrogant message. They are self-willed. It's not only an arrogant message, it's an irrational message. Look at verse 12. But these, we're talking about these false teachers, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand. It's an ignorant message. Y'all know we have a little dog named Jasmine, and, uh, and she's a sweet little dog most of the time, but she sometimes decides she's going to behave like a dog, you know, and she's going to go outside and she's going to stick her nose in things that I don't think she needs to stick her nose into, and she's going to try to do some things that I really don't want her to do. She, she's a dog. She's doing her normal dog things. Animals were created for the glory of God, but they do not have a soul that will live forever as you and I do, though they do have some beast type of intelligence and intellect. I mean, it's, it's uncanny. Jasmine knows when it's time to eat. I mean, by the clock. She gets it within about 15 minutes. If I'm not there feeding her, she's coming to pastor me. She knows. Those of you who've milked cows all your life, you know that those cows understand when the, the time to eat is. They come in and they're ready to go. And if you're not there for some reason and the, the food's not available, they're starting to ball and fuss and carry on. There, there is a level of intelligence among animals, but not like with you and me. And they are not created in God's image as you and I are. And God, since the days of Noah, has given animals to mankind as a source of food. There's a huge difference between mankind and animals. And so Peter likens these false teachers to these dumb brute beasts who can only function by instinct. They're only able to function by the drives, the natural drives in their physical bodies. And Peter says that's what these false teachers are like. They are driven by those natural instincts, uncontrolled by the Spirit of God. I mean, have you considered the behavior of, of natural man, people that don't know Jesus Christ? The only thing they're worried about is their, their physical 
needs and physical passions and physical desires. It's all about this life. It's all about this moment. It's all about this world. It's all about me, me, me. What makes me feel good? If it feels good, do it. Was the phrase that was so popular a number of years ago. Though we don't see the phrase on the media as much, the, the idea of it permeates society. That's like these false teachers. They are like brute beasts. They speak about things they don't even begin to understand. But they will utterly perish in their own corruption. Theirs is a, an arrogant message. It is an ignorant message, or an irrational message, I should say. And it is a deceptive message. Notice what it says here in verse 13. They're going to receive their wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. Their spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. They're right in here among us. I mean, not in this room, but in the church. These people are right there. They are feasting among the believers. They are doing things with it. And all the while, their poisonous deception is purposely being disseminated among the flock. Have you ever come in contact with somebody who just exuded evil and wanted to harm you? It's kind of a scary position to be in. But there are people who want to do you harm. Whether physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, whatever it is. There are people in this world whose purpose, whose goal, whose desire, whose passion is to do harm to others. That is especially true in the spiritual realm. Satan, that father of lies, that great deceiver, that first one in rebellion, wants to lead others in rebellion against God. And he will stop at nothing in his attempt to do that. And if he has to masquerade as an angel of light, if he has to take some truths out of the Bible and use those as an entry into a Christian group, a Christian gathering, he will do that. I get so amazed... Sometimes you're talking, maybe you've talked to people like this, you, you've talked to them about things they read on the newspaper or see on television or get on the internet, and, and you'll challenge what they've said or what they've read or what they've heard, and you'll get something like this. Well, they wouldn't put it, let them put it on the internet if it wasn't true. <laughs> they wouldn't let them put it in the newspaper if it wasn't right. There is a person who is able to be fooled very, very easily. Because they've got their trust all in the wrong place. And that's what these false teachers count on. Satan does not come with a tail and horns and a pitchfork in a red suit. We don't all recognize it. He comes in the guise of nice people. They look good. They smell good. They act nicely. They say Christian words. They try to pass themselves off as legitimate, but they are in fact wolves in sheep's clothing. Do you get that phrase? They are wolves. Ravenous wolves, ready to destroy, ready to kill, ready to deceive, in sheep's 
Clothing, how many times does God refer to believers as sheep? My sheep hear my voice. My sheep know me. They're trying to look like Christians. It is a deceptive message. They are deceiving others. And they are self-deceived. But, back to verse 12, they will utterly perish in their own corruption. They will receive the wages of unrighteousness. Peter is reminding us, yes, they may look the part, they may act the part, they may have some success in their deception, but don't be fooled because they will be punished. God is not deceived. And God will deal with them in due time. What are they like? Well, let's look at verse 13. Hypocrisy fills their actions, their spots and blemishes while they feast with you. They, they, verse 14, they have eyes full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin. The, their, their moral behavior is horrendous. Oh, maybe not on the surface, but you dig down a little more deeply and you are heartbroken sometimes at what you find. They cannot cease from sin. They can't stop themselves. They just, because there's no, nothing there to put the brakes on. The Spirit of God is not dwelling within them because they are not believers. We'll see that here in just a moment. So there's nothing there to put the brakes on. They're, they're just going pell-mell down the side of the mountain completely out of control and they're going to crash when they get to the end. They're enticing, unstable souls. Oh, it's amazing, beloved. These cults and isms and so forth, they love to get to somebody who's a brand new Christian. Because you don't know much yet. And they can, by weaving their webs of intrigue and deception, they can take a brand new Christian and divert them and get them off the track so that they never mature. They never become the kind of believer that God wants them to become. The, the false teachers love to pray on somebody who's just beginning to understand the things of God, which is why, beloved, it's not enough to preach just salvation. You have to preach salvation and then maturing in the faith, going on, becoming more familiar with this book, getting it to sink deeply into your soul. There's that whole concept of script, uh, Christian maturity. When, when a mom delivers a baby at the hospital, she doesn't walk out the door and hope that that baby grows up and becomes a good citizen or whatever. I mean, that would be craziness. The mom takes the baby with her because she has to nurture it. She has to nourish it. She has to teach it. It becomes part of a family where it grows and matures. And in that whole process becomes a mature adult. Same thing has to happen spiritually. When somebody comes to know Jesus Christ, that's not when the work begins or ends. That's when the work begins. The Holy Spirit brings to new life and to birth and brings that brand new believer into a fellowship of believers. And then it's there in that family that we train and we nurture and we encourage and we help and we strengthen and we cause some maturity to happen. So the false teachers love to short-circuit that and find those unstable, untrained, untaught souls to lead them astray. They, the, unte the, the uh, false teachers, have a heart trained in covetous practices. They want what you've got. Most of the time it's your money. But sometimes it's your allegiance. Sometimes it's your support. Sometimes they just like to control your life and get you to do their bidding. 
goes on, verse 15, they have forsaken the right way and are gone astray. They're following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. You can read about it in the book of Numbers this afternoon. There was a prophet who apparently had some reputation as a trustworthy person. And a king named Balak decided he was going to hire this guy, Balaam, to come and curse God's people there on the borders of Moab as they were ready to come into the promised land. And Balaam at first was warned not to go by God. But he went. Balak had made all kinds of promises about what he was going to pay him and the honors that he would give him. And Balaam, though he carries the name prophet, I'm not sure that Balaam knew the Lord God as thoroughly as he wanted to let on. Oh, God spoke to him. But that doesn't mean that Balaam necessarily was the prophet that had God's approval. Because he was going to accept an invitation to curse God's people. Now that makes no sense, does it? Although when he got there, he told the king, he said, Now I can't say anything except what God tells me to say. And he said what God told him to say, and he was pronouncing a blessing upon God's people, and it infuriated Balak tried several times and kept getting more blessings and no curses. But then Balaam did something else. He kind of dropped the hint that if you want to destroy this people, I can't say anything bad against them, but if you want to destroy this people, uh, send some of your women over there. Let them do the job. Send, send some false priests over there. Let them do the job. And sure enough, you can read about the sin of Baal, Peor, and how it killed so, uh, so many Israelites, got caught up in that, and, and it was a total disaster, and it really did harm. That's not what the genuine prophet of God would do, is it? To give the enemies of God a little insight onto how to undermine the people of God. <laughs> But Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness. He wanted the money. He wanted the success. He wanted everything that the king was offering to him. And so he sold his soul for all the stuff that he couldn't keep. Well, verse 17 describes, you know, it kind of begs a question, doesn't it? It says, why are these false teachers Christians that just got confused? Or are they something else? They're something else. Notice, it goes on in the description, it says they're wells without water, clouds carried by tempest. They're dry wells, they're rainless clouds. For whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever? That's the same statement that was made about the fallen angels earlier in, in chapter 1 of this book. Verse 18, it says, They speak great swelling words of emptiness. They allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. They promise them liberty. They themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Many have looked at that and said, oh, these false teachers must have been genuine Christians that either A, got confused, or B, lost their faith. I don't think either one's right. I think C is the correct option. They were never Christians to begin with. And here's why I think that. Notice the last part 
Verse 21. He says, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. I can train Jasmine to be obedient and to do what I want her to do, but I cannot change her nature. She is a dog. And there are things that will occur in life, regardless of what the training is that she might have, she will respond to that like a dog. You can wash a pig, but when the pig goes out into the pen, it's going to behave like a pig. And these folks who heard the message, who maybe even adopted some of the principles of it, like love your neighbor, and, and be nice, and do good, and all of those things, they, they kind of pick and choose all the nice things that Scripture talks about. And they, they weave that into a belief system. They weave that into a gospel. And they go out and they try to proclaim that. Something will happen that will knock the props out from under them. And they will behave exactly according to their nature. Which is that of an unsaved person. False teachers are masters at deceit. They are not Christians who have been confused a little bit. They are not Christians who have maybe lost their salvation. They never were believers to start with. They were crafters of iniquity and deceit. And they... Oh my, they just... They want to kill you. They do. They want to separate you from God forever. Real quick, and i got to thank Pastor Adrian Rogers for this. And that was all introduction, by the way. Here's the message. <laughs> Here's five tests to know whether or not you're listening to a false teacher. Okay? I'm going to cover it quick. Number one. The source test. What is their source for what they're teaching? If they have any authority other than the scriptures, your little antenna better go up. For example, the Mormons have the Book of Mormon. Oh, they like the Bible. They like the Bible. But the real source is the Book of Mormon. And some other books that once you get into the system, then you begin to learn what other things are the source of authority. Of course, then there's the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they have the Watchtower, which is kind of their publication piece, or the Awake magazine. And, and those promote their doctrine. They are their sources. They are quoting from their prophets. But they also have a Bible. Now, they don't really like the Bible like you and I have. They have what's called the New World Translation, which twists the Word of God. For example, in the Gospel of John, instead of saying that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, they have in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Did you catch that? They've, they've created their own little translation so that they can promote their false doctrine. Or Christian science. Oh, Christian science. Well, wow, yeah, that, that sounds good. Let's look at science from a Christian perspective, right? What, what's that mean? No. It's all about Mary Baker Eddy and her keys to health and scripture. Her key, uh, science and health with keys to the scripture, I think is the correct title. It's it's another source of information that 
They first bring and they lay it alongside the Bible, but then eventually it's on top of the Bible, and eventually they get rid of the Bible altogether, and all you have is the teachings of someone else. And I could go on. Various groups that, that have other sources of authority. And it may be even a TV preacher who has published a recent book and you know got 10 steps to success or whatever it is. I don't know what the titles are. I don't waste my time. But that becomes their authority. Oh, they might quote scripture in it occasionally. A half a verse here, part of a verse there, a little bit here, a little bit there. But they never quote the context. They never look at the whole counsel of God. They pick and they choose. And eventually, it's not the Bible anymore. It's the writings of the teacher. It's their book that is their authority. What's the source text? False teachers have to have some source other than the Word of God. Or then there's the Savior test. Is salvation, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, focused in Jesus Christ alone? Most of these false teachers end up promoting themselves as the Savior. You follow my teaching, you follow me, and you'll do just fine. They're putting themselves forward as the, the Savior and not Jesus Christ. So we have the source test and the Savior test. What's the subject test? This book, the Bible, has its subject as Almighty God. It is God's revelation of Himself from Him down to us. It's not the other way around. You, you, wherever you turn in Scripture, God is the focal point. Even in the redeeming of mankind, God is the focal point of that whole redemption process. The book is about God. It's not a book to gain health and wealth. It's not a book that if you read it, you'll fix your own self-image. It's not a book that's designed to help you be successful in business. But how many times do false teachers take the book and put a little different twist on it? The subject is not Jesus Christ. The subject is health, wealth, self-help, whatever it might be. Social reform, whatever. The salvation test. This is number four. Is it by grace, through faith, not of works, Ephesians 2, 8. Is that how you're saved? Or is it by keeping all of these laws and regulations and rules and, and behaviors? And, and can, do you have to have this certain knowledge in order to really be saved? Is there anything that they're adding to that free gift of salvation, which is undeserved and cannot be earned, but which is offered to us as a gracious gift from Almighty God. Amen. The salvation test. And then finally, the sanctification test. Do these false teachers, first of all, live a holy life themselves? And do they encourage their listeners to live a holy life? You see, when you and I genuinely come into contact with the Lord Jesus Christ, when we are filled with His Holy Spirit, two things happen. Number one, we begin to abhor our own sin. And number two, we begin to live a transformed, a holy life because... We are indwelt by the Spirit and because we love the one who has saved us. When someone says, I'm a Christian, and you look at their life and they're living like hell on earth, guess what? They're not saved. There's evidence 
of salvation. And it's called sanctification. Now, does that mean that when a person is saved that suddenly no more temptation ever in their life and everything just is perfect? No. Growth. Babies are born. Babies have to grow. Christians are born of the Spirit of God and they have a whole lifetime of things to unlearn a whole lifetime of things now to learn. There's always going to be that growth. We're still living in a fallen world. We're still susceptible to sin and temptation. There's going to be times just like when a little kid learns to walk, they fall down and bust their knees and hurt their nose. It's going to do the same thing in the Christian life. There's going to be times when they fail. But when that happens, that conviction that comes and that repentance that follows, and that desire to grow and not do it again, is an indication of the reality of the sanctifying process that God has started in their lives. All of those things help us to distinguish the false Gospels from the true. And it takes discernment. It takes discernment. So beloved, I'm going to leave you with this. It's in 1 John chapter 4 verses, and you can turn there with me, 1 John chapter 4 verses 1 through 3. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Do not believe every person you see on the television. Do not believe every person that publishes a book. Do not believe every person that has an internet program or it's on the radio. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. That word test means to examine carefully, to try it, not, not in the sense of, hey, I'm going to obey it and try it, but, but to test it, you know, to, to put it to trial and see whether or not it is genuine, whether or not it is true. Test the spirits, to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. It is the Spirit of Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. Now, confessing that Jesus has come in the flesh is a whole package deal. It means they're confessing, they're agreeing that He is God, that He has left heaven, that He has taken on human form, that He's come in the flesh, He's lived a sinless life, He's died on the cross, He's risen from the dead. It's a whole package deal. From Genesis to Revelation. That's what it means to confess the Lord Jesus Christ. If somebody is doing that, the message is from the Lord. It's consistent with the Word. But if they're denying, then it's something you need to stay away from. Beloved, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. But rather, Get into the book. We've got everything we need here for life and godliness. It's all profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God, the woman of God, the person of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good one, for living life. That's why we're memorizing those verses. That's why we're focused in the Word. That's why we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Because there's deception out there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've hardly scratched the surface. You've given us so much. And, and, and our time is gone. But Lord, I pray that you will take these words and that you will sink them deeply into our souls. And that we will become men and women of the book that we will 
study your word, that we will fill our minds with it, that we will not allow ourselves to be deceived. Give us wisdom, give us discernment. Father, preserve and protect your people. Because we're in the midst of a world that is filled, filled with rebellion and deception and disaster. Help us to be those bright lights that you want us to be. And Father, if there's somebody here this morning who has been deceived, I pray that your spirit will bring such conviction upon their hearts and minds that they will turn from that deception and that they will come to you. That they will find in you all that they need for life and godliness. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives in these days. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.